All right, so I guess a basic definition of an exoplanet is any planet that is in a planetary system other than our own solar system. So to date, um, NASA has found more than 4,500 exoplanets orbiting around other stars. Um, the region of galaxy that we search for exoplanets is really small, um, but nevertheless, we've found thousands of exoplanets in that small area. So let's talk a little bit about some of the methods for finding exoplanets. Um, we've talked about this before that when we look at other um, protostellar disks or circumstellar disks, um, we can see that planets must form around other stars. And this is part of what contributes to our theory of how our own solar system formed, right? There's a disk of gas and dust that spins down into a flat disk around young stars. And out of those disks, our planets start to condense out of that disk. And over time, the protoplanets become full-blown planets. So this isn't really um, watching the formation of planets, but it's watching the formation of the disk that forms planets. So we know that these baby solar systems will eventually have planets. Um, you can see planets directly forming around other stars. You can't see the planets, but you can see the choices that they leave in those circumstellar disks as they gather up the dust and gas from within their orbits. So here's the kind of cartoon image of a planet gathering up the material in its orbit, and here's what it actually looks like. You can see many dark rings, and those are all um, the traces of new planets. Okay, so beyond this, this doesn't really tell us that much other than there will be planets there, but we want to know, like, what are those planets like? So we use two different techniques. The first one is called the Doppler effect. Um, if you've ever heard an ambulance speed past you, right, then you hear that the pitch of the sound that it creates will go up and then it will go down in pitch as it passes you. So uh, this is a, the Doppler effect is basically that a wave that's created, the wave peaks get closer together as an object approaches you, as they kind of pile up in front of the object, and that causes a higher frequency. And as they go away, they get bunched or stretched out, and that results in a lower frequency. So the same Doppler effect that you hear when an ambulance passes you also happens to light, because light is also a wave. So as a star moves toward or away from us, then the light that it puts off, its frequency goes higher as it comes toward us, and it goes lower as it goes away. And so um, I don't expect you to know all the details of the Doppler effect, except to say that this is one of the primary methods by which we observe exoplanets. It was the first way that we ever measured an exoplanet. So essentially what we're doing is we're looking at a star, we're looking at the frequency of light that it's giving off, and we're looking for little changes in that frequency over time. So let me kind of illustrate this in a visual way. Um, if you have an exoplanet that's orbiting a star, it causes small wobbles in that star's position um, because they, the star and exoplanet actually share um, a center of mass and they both orbit that center of mass. Um, the larger the exoplanet, the farther away from the star that center of mass will be. So for Jupiter, the center of mass um, that it orbits along with the sun is a little bit spaced off from the actual sun. So that means that other solar, you know, other astronomers, if they're measuring out there, if they exist in some other planet and are looking at our planet, um, they would see our star wobble back and forth due to the motion of Jupiter. So as this happens, the star is sometimes moving closer to us as the observer and sometimes moving farther away. When it moves toward us, the light that that star gives off will look like it is what we call blue shifted. It will be slightly more blue than it usually is. And when the star is moving away from us, it will be red shifted. And so if we measure over time the frequency, then we can measure the blue shift and then the red shift. And this curve would continue periodically. And we can use the periodicity of the curve um, to measure the mass of that planet.
Okay. So we're measuring over time. And just to tie into what we already know, which is the law that relates the orbital time of an object to its semi major axis. Okay. Yeah, so remember Kepler's third law just says that orbits are ellipses. Kepler's second law is the equal areas in equal times. Um, and then Kepler's third law is the one that relates orbital times to semi major axis. So what does that mean for our Doppler effect radial velocity method? Well, it means that as we measure the stellar velocity, the speed of the star as it moves away from us and toward us over time, um, we plot out a curve of um, blue shift and red shift periodically alternating. And we can measure the, um, the time between um, the maxima or the minima of this curve and that will give us the orbit time of the planet. So that can also then give us the semi-major axis. And then um, in order to measure the planet's mass, um, we can look at the magnitude of the blue shift versus the red shift. So that would be the, the um, sort of height of this overall curve. Uh, a large gas giant like Jupiter will cause more of a wobble than a small terrestrial planet like Earth. And so therefore the, um, the, I guess, difference between the stellar velocity at its fastest toward us and at its fastest away from us can give us the planet's mass. Um, in order to use this technique, we actually need to know the star's mass as well, but we have other methods for getting that that don't depend on this. So we generally have that information. Um, this radial velocity method since it is uh, strongest for large planets, works best for large planets. So you wouldn't be able to find generally very small planets like the Earth with this method. Okay, what questions do you have about this idea of measuring velocity versus time? Okay, I'll ask you, a question to check your understanding here. So let's suppose that planet A is generating this solid red curve of orbital velocity over time. And then um, planet B is generating the blue curve. The question is, oops, let me pull up the poll. Um, which star's planet is farther away from it? So assume that these are similar stars which planet is farther from the star? So yes, star B um, is the answer because it's got a larger orbital time. And we know from Kepler's third law that a larger orbital time corresponds to a farther semi-major axis. All right. So that's a little bit about how we use these radial velocity curves. Um, but many more planets now are detected by the transit method. So this is you know, a relatively conceptually simple idea where a planet can transit in front of a sun as it orbits um, if it happens to be aligned properly with our line of sight. And so then the star's brightness will drop as the planet transits in front of it. So this idea is called transit photometry. And what we would measure if we were looking at a star and watching for transits is it would have, um, you know, brightness over time is what we would be measuring. And we'd just be looking for dips in its brightness over time. Um, on such a curve, the orbit time would be given by the timing between when the brightness starts to dip each time, or you could use, easily measure it at the end as well. And since that gives us orbit time, it will also give us semi-major axis. And then the depth of the curve here will give us the ratio of the planet's size to the star's size, because the area of the star that's blocked by the planet will be proportional to the area of the planet. And so it will be proportional to the radius squared of the planet for that reason, since area scales as pi r squared. All right. 
Um, you can also get some radius information by the timing it takes to get from the minimum brightness back to the maximum brightness. Um, but as you'll see for a lot of planets, uh, the transit curves are um, pretty steep. And so it would be hard to extract that information. So in general, um, the depth of that curve is gonna be the easiest variable to measure. And then the timing between subsequent dips is also easy to measure. All right, so the um, transit method is what the Kepler telescope uses. Um, it was operational from 2009 to 2018. And during that time, it discovered um, over 2,500 planets. The overall cost, if you divide it by how many planets were discovered as a result, is about $300,000 per planet or a little less. Um, the test mission launched in 2018. It's currently operational. And so far, um, they have confirmed 82 planets. Um, there are about 2,500 candidates available. It takes time to confirm a planet. You know, once you have a, a signal that looks like a planet, um, you have to do some careful analysis to finally confirm that it really is one. So these are the two main telescopes that are looking for exoplanets now. And the, uh, a recent survey of astronomers called the Decadal Survey, it happens every 10 years. Um, they just prioritized one new exoplanet telescope uh, as one of their main priorities moving forward. Can the transit method be used to find uh, free floating planets or rogue planets? Um, no, because it, you would want to um, see a periodic behavior. If you just see one transit, for example, in a transit curve, you can't really be sure if it's a, a, a orbiting planet or like you said, it could be a rogue planet. Um, it could be a star that passes behind some interstellar dust. So a single brightness dip doesn't give you any information. You need at least three brightness dips to be really sure that you found an exoplanet. And so for that reason, rogue planets, if they're no longer orbiting their star, like they got kicked off gravitationally, um, they would generally not have this you know, periodic behavior if they're not in orbit. Um, for planets like that, I think the best way to detect them would be to use infrared telescopes. Um, because those planets like the Earth radiate based on their temperatures. And so that radiation would be in the infrared and you can pick them out that way. There are some brown dwarf, um, if you want to look into it, brown dwarfs are like planets that are almost big enough to be stars, but not quite. And sometimes those are all alone because they formed like a star forms instead of like a planet forms. So they're more like failed stars than, than like planets. Other questions about the transit method? Okay, this is the method that you'll use in your lab. So I'll be giving you real exoplanet data and you will be looking at the light curve to figure out how many planets are in the system and how big are the planets. 